Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's 2023 MVPs Overview and Office Hours webinar. During today's webinar, subject matter experts from CMS will address questions related to registration and reporting for the Quality Payment Programs, MIPS Value Pathways, or MVPs, the newest reporting option to fulfill MIPS require, reporting requirements. So this webinar will begin with a brief overview of the 2023 MVP registration process and the resources available to help you with registration. And CMS will then review and provide answers to some of the most commonly asked questions about MVP participation requirements. And then this webinar will conclude with an open Q&A session where CMS subject matter experts will answer MVP specific questions from the audience. And just as a note, a recording of today's webinar, as well as a copy of the slides, which will include all the hyperlinks you see on screen today, will be available on the QPP webinar library in the coming weeks. So with that said, I will now turn it over to Sophia Shugmar to get us started. Sophia? Thanks, Matt. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Our focus for today is only going to be on the MIPS Valley Pathways. I know we have a lot of policies, policy areas within traditional MIPS that we could cover, but we wanted to really keep the focus of today's webinar on MIPS value pathways. We um, observed a number of questions that we've received, and we thought it would be of value to have a webinar dedicated to not just presenting material, but mostly spending time answering what the most frequently asked questions that we receive. And so with that, we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so starting with um, the overview, MIPS value pathways are available beginning with the 2023 performance year, and they are the newest way to participate in the program. And um, MIPS Value Pathways uh, offer clinicians and um, groups and specialists the opportunity to report on subsets of measures and activities that are clinically relevant to one another. So this really helps to condense down this large measure inventory that we had um, and really could, provides them with more um, meaningful choices. There are other ways to also participate in the program. We still have traditional MIPS around in which, you know, clinicians typically for quality, as an example, have to report six measures. And then we also have the APP. Um, so we do encourage that if you have any uh, further inkling into a MIPS Valley Pathways that you take a look at our resource library. Uh, we have a number of resources related to MIPS Valley Pathways. And um, I would also just encourage you to look at these guides that we have posted um, that have a significant um, level of detail that would probably be, be helpful to understand the types of MIPS value pathways we've previously proposed and finalized. We also have a guide related to the ones that were included in the 2024 uh, proposed rule that was just published recently. And um, we have a document and resources related to MVP development. We've um, Establish a process in which uh, stakeholders can participate in the MVP development and maintenance process. And so there are related resources to provide some guidance on, on how you can provide feedback uh, throughout those processes or participate in those processes. Next slide, please. Okay, so as we mentioned before, uh, the MIPS eligible clinicians have three ways in which they can participate. Um, traditional MIPS is, you know, what, what, what I've previously mentioned, they have a larger inventory of measures and activities available to them. They can select measures and, um, uh, you know, choose to report on six at, at, at least for quality. Um, MIPS Valley Pathways, we're trying to achieve a more streamlined way to a, a, a report and participate in the program. So we have this, we have about 12 MVPs that were implemented for calendar year 2023. We have a few changes that we proposed through the 2024 rulemaking process that uh, I will refer you to that uh, recording of our calendar year 2024 proposed rule webinar uh, for those details. And we have associated resources related to that. In contrast to traditional MIPS, their reporting requirements are a bit reduced. So rather than, for example, reporting six measures, uh, a clinician would only have to report four. And uh, for improvement activities, it's either one high-weighted or two medium-weighted activities. Um, there is also the opportunity for enhanced performance feedback uh, in that the clinicians who submit on an MVP are compared to those who submit on in the same MVP. So the cohort that you're compared to is a bit more prescriptive. Um, we do encourage the participation of 
we do encourage clinicians to participate through the MIPS Valley Pathways to the extent they're ready to do so. Um, we have indicated in um, previous rulemaking cycles that we, we anticipate in a future year, we will sunset traditional MIPS and we see MIPS Valley Pathways being the future of the program. So we highly encourage while MVPs are voluntary that, uh, you know, clinicians begin to orient themselves and slowly uh, take on MVP reporting to, to prepare for a future state where MVPs are the only thing available from the MIPS side. Uh, in addition to those two options, we also have the APP, and uh, there are reduced reporting requirements associated to, with the APP, and it's a great option for those that are in a MIPS APM and want to, you know, also have the opportunity to re report on fewer things. And there is a side note here that those that are in the shared savings program, ACOs, they must report on the quality measures within the APP. And uh, the APP is also optional for MIPS eligible clinicians who just participate in the MIPS APMs. Next slide, please. With regards to the quality performance category weights, you'll note here across the board, the, the various um, performance weight assignments. So for quality and traditional MIPS, uh, you'll note that it's at 30%, 40% for small practices, and 55% for APM entities. Within MVPs, it aligns with what it is for traditional MIPS. We have not made any distinctions or differences there, but the APP is a bit different. Its quality is at 50%. Uh, and within the measure requirements, you'll note the, the various uh, contrasts within the reporting requirements from traditional MIPS. MIPS at six measures, to MVPs is four measures. The APP offers the opportunity to report on three measures that are required. Um, and then the, there's a side note here for the ACOs who can choose the 10 web interface measures instead if they so choose to. Next slide, please. For registration for the MVPs, just please note that the MVP registration window is open. Uh, it will close on November 30th at 8 p.m. Um, the registration for those that choose, there are certain instances where we have included the CAPS for MIPS measure within the MVP. And if you are a clinician who is interested in reporting the CAPS measure as it pertains to MVP, please just be mindful of the, that separate registration deadline. It's a separate registration process, which closes on June 30th. So if you are intending on reporting CAPS for MIPS for the MVP, please make sure you register for that separately and do so by the associated deadline, which is actually already passed. Um, and um, Aside from that, if you are reporting on an MVP that includes the primary, this CAPS for MIPS measure, uh, and you don't intend to on reporting on it, then that, that deadline does not pertain to you. As long as you register by the November 30th deadline, um, you have the opportunity to then choose which measures you want to report on. As a reminder, you can still report traditional MIPS or the APP, even if you register for an MVP. We've, um, we have scoring hierarchy policies, which allow for you uh, to report in multiple ways, and we would then take the higher of. In a sense, you might submit your traditional MIPS uh, data submission, and then separately decide you also want to try out a MIPS value pathway and, and report in a MIPS value pathway in a separate submission. We would not aggregate the two submissions to get you a, a high score, but we would calculate each uh, submission separately to then um, look at the final score for each of those separate submissions and then overall take the highest one to count as your final score. So that does give you an opportunity to then, um, you know, see how you do in the MIPS value pathway, but then it, as a fail safe, you, you already have submitted your traditional MIPS, uh, for example, data submission. So that, that opportunity is there for those that are curious and interested in doing so. Um, in order to register, you have to make sure you have a QPP security official role. An APM entity MVP registration must be submitted by the representative of the APM entity with, with this security official role. There's a whole user guide associated to how to obtain a security official role. Highly encourage you to look at that or have your designated representative from your practice uh, look at that as well as needed. Um, you'll need to complete a registration form that uh, requires several fields of information. And so the details of that can be found in the fact sheet, which is also available on our QPP resource library. And when you're done, you should email that to the QPP at cms.hhs.gov email address with the uh, subject line MVP registration. 
That way the service center can create a ticket associated to your registration process and they will communicate any uh, updates related to your registration through that pathway. Next slide, please. All right, so the next several slides, we actually have highlighted a number of areas where we've had frequently asked questions and we're just gonna um, try to go through a few of those and then open it up so we can really kind of allow for more time and interaction um, through Q&A. Uh, so let's move to the next slide. What are the participation options for reporting an MVP? So with the MVP, you can report as an individual group, subgroup, a, and a group could be a single specialty group or a multi-specialty group or an APM entity. Um, we don't currently have policies that allow for virtual group participation in um, MVPs, nor, nor can voluntary or opt-in reporters. Sorry, can you go backwards, please? Okay. Nor can voluntary or opt-in reporters uh, participate in MIPS Valley Pathways at this time. And another flag we wanted to just put out here is for uh, multi-specialty groups that beginning with 2026, we have put a requirement and policy where um, beginning in 2026, multi-specialty groups must form subgroups in order to report MIPS Valley Pathways. Now, we haven't said prescriptively that a subgroup can only be made up of X number of clinicians or X number of specialties. We've left the subgroup criteria a bit broad intentionally at this, at this time because we know medicine is not black or white and there are multiple ways to practice, multiple ways in which a pract clinical, clinician practices are formed and multi-specialty practices are formed and we don't want to take away from that team-based care model. So we've intentionally kept the subgroup criteria broad um, to see how subgroups can form and allow for that to occur. So we just want to be clear on that. Um, we understand that there is a level of burden associated with subgroup formation uh, that increases the number of MVPs you might have to report as a multi-specialty group, but really want to flag the value of having more granular data that is tied back to the clinicians where the specialists feel like they can make more meaningful improvements in the care they thought they, they provide and that the data is meaningful to them. And on the other side of that, that the data is also meaningful to the patients as well and in making a more informed decision about who's involved in the care they receive. Next slide, please. Okay. Can an individual report different or the same MVPs at different levels? We can hit enter one more time to get the answer on. So yes, um, a provider can report as an individual group or a subgroup if they're all at the same practice. Um, they would have to have separate registration. So the clinician, I'm sorry, can we go back? We're not done with that question. Um, the, the the clinician would have to register as an individual and then separately as a subgroup and then re register with their TIN. Um, the um, individual provider could not register by themselves three different times. They would have to register with their associated um, participation option. Next slide, please. Okay, can we load the answer? If a clinician works at two practices, can the clinician report an MVP as an individual under each TIN? Yes, as long as that they register for the MVP under each 10 NPI combination by the associated MVP registration deadline, which is November 30th, uh, what will be expected is that, you know, they would, in order for them to receive a score, they would have to actually submit. Um, so we would expect that there would be an associated submission um, with that, with each of their unique um, registrations. Next slide, please. If we decide to roll some of our eligible clinicians to report an MVP, do our other eligible clinicians still have to report? Yes. So if you have, you might have a, a group of clinicians where there might be an MVP that's available, but not necessarily attributable to all those clinicians. So we would expect in that sense, those clinicians who uh, the MVP is attributable to would report the MVP through the MVP registration process, register for it, and report it, report the MVP. 
the other clinicians in the group would continue to participate, but would report traditional MIPS or the APP as it's, if it's applicable to them. Next slide. If a TIN's made up of two clinician types, um, how would MVP reporting work? Would the entire TIN have to report or uh, would they have to form a subgroup? So there are really, there's not a, there's not one answer. There are several options that could occur here. So either that the TIN the, at the group level registers and reports for the, the advancing care for heart disease MVP as a group, or that, the, or it could be that the cardiologist, you know, registers a subgroup and then they report on the associated cardiology related MVP. And then separately, the urologists continue to report traditional MIPS as individuals, or the cardiologists register and report for as a subgroup, and the TIN reports the traditional MIPS as a group. So the, the TIN in its entirety, including those cardiologists, would report traditional MIPS. And um, what would happen in that scenario is that the TIN would achieve a score, a final score, and then the cardiologists who report on the MVP as a subgroup would have basically two scores. They'd have the subgroup score, subgroup level score for, for the MVP, and then they would have their traditional MIPS score. And what we would do on our side is assess which of the scores is the higher of and count that towards their, their MIPS final score for that year. Next slide. If there are if there is a physician group practice with only one TIN, but the practice consists of four specialties, can the practice report their providers as, as a group for one MVP, via one MVP? So yes, currently as currently finalized, a multi-specialty practice can report an MVP as a group for 2023, 2020, 20, 2024, and 2025. Beginning in 2026, I do want to flag that we will require these multi-specialty groups to form subgroups. So uh, the large cohort of, um, of a practice should then be able to break down in a meaningful way to the practice into subgroups and report on the associated and most clinically relevant MVPs that are available. Next slide, please. If a practice registers to report as an MVP as a group, then and can they later decide to report the MVP as individuals? Only they can make those changes only by the deadline. So the the limitation there is it has to be done by November thirtieth. Those changes to the the way in which they will report the MVP, um, the practice practices security official would need to complete and. Um, submit one registration form per individual clinician that intends to report the MVP at the individual level. So if the practice does not update their MVP registration and doesn't want to report the MVP at the group level, they could also just report traditional MIPS at the individual or group report group level and choose not to submit anything for the MVP submission. So the point here being that you could register to report MVPs and not register and not actually submit anything. We would you not get you would not get penalized for that. If you choose to, if you change your mind and then uh, decide to report traditional MIPS instead. Next slide. Can, uh, can we select an MVP for the orthopedic specialty if the orthopedic providers are a part of different practices? No. In this instance, there are four ways you can report the MVP at the individual level, where one clinician's data is collected at 110, at the group level subgroup level or the APM level, but there's no way in which we could pick and choose and select specifically providers that are part of different practices and kind of aggregate their submission. That 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 is not an option under um, in MIPS generally anyways. Next slide. As we add new providers throughout the year, is there a process to get them added into an added to an MVP? If you're registered to report as an MVP group, report an MVP as a subgroup and you want to add providers, you would need to do so by the deadline of November 30th. Uh, for 2023, the registration process is handled through the email as we talked about earlier. So you would just need to follow up on your service center ticket to get that those changes made by the November 30th deadline. For providers that join your practice after September 30th, 2022, we won't be able to report they won't be able to report an MVP at the individual level for 2023 because their eligibility um, 
at the practice would be based on the second segment of MIPS determination. And that looks at claims submitted for October 1st, 2022 through September 30th, 2023. And that unfortunately won't be available until December of 2023. And that would be after the registration period closes. So um, that would be the time timeline cutoff in which uh, you could not update your registration because of, of that uh, of the, the timing difference there. Next slide. Um, with regards to subgroup participation, we've had a lot of questions on the way in which uh, subgroups can be formed, what would be expected from a reporting standpoint. So what I, as I mentioned before, we haven't been as prescriptive with the subgroup um, criteria, uh, formation criteria, and that has been done intentionally because we know that practices are set up in a multitude of ways and include a multitude of, it could, could possibly include a multitude of, uh, you know, clinician types. So in these examples, they're just for illustrative purposes only, and uh, just to provide you an example of how MVPs could be reported because there are a multitude of ways. Uh, in this instance, in example one, you can register and report as a group, say in this example, we have anesthesiologists, CRNAs, and orthopedic surgeons in one group, and they are reporting an MVP. Um, so in this option, in this instance, they have two options available to them. The they could not register for both options, but the but the group that consists of these anesthesiologists, CRNAs, and orthopedic surgeons would then decide as a group which MVP to register for, and complete the registration and uh, for one of these two MVPs, and then report as a group. In the second example, they decide to register the same group. They just decided to register as two subgroups and report two different MVPs, which is completely fine as well. So you have in uh, the left-hand side of the table, your anesthesiologists and CRNAs have decided that they want to report the anesthesia-specific MVP. And so they form this subgroup and are reporting the anesthesia-specific MVP that's available. And then we have the orthopedic surgeons from the same group who have decided that they want to report on the orthopedic surgery-specific uh, MVP as it's more attributable to their care. So they've decided to form their own subgroup within their 10 and report on those measures. So that is also another option available to the, to, to the practice. Next slide, please. Does the population health measure count as one of my four required quality measures? No. So in this instance, population health measures, it would technically be the fifth quality measure that is reported. Um, however, I will just note that we don't actually require you to submit data on the population health measure. It's something we calculate on the back end through um, administrative claims based data. Um, so you are required to report four measures, one of which needs to be a uh, outcome or high priority measure. And then the population health measure is an additional quality measure that we calculate um, once you've identified which population health measure you would like to be attributed to your score through the registration process. Next slide, please. What benchmarks are used for quality measures in MVPs? It's, we use the same benchmarks that are currently exist for each of the individual MIPS quality measures in and QCDR measures um, in traditional MIPS. We are not creating new benchmarks or um, carving out MVP submissions separate from traditional MIPS sub submissions when it comes to um, data for benchmarking purposes. Next slide, please. Well, the measure has no benchmark top down and seven point cap indicators on the benchmarking file apply for MVPs as well. Yes, so from a quality scoring standpoint, many of those policies if not all those policies apply to both MIPS value pathways and traditional MIPS. Next slide. Can we select measures for multiple MVPs to meet reporting requirements? No, if you register for one, you can only register for one MVP. Um, so you will be able to have the option to select from, a, from some a list of measures within the MVP and choose four, uh, but you cannot select outside of that to then have that attributed to your MIPS value pathway submission. You have to select from the MIPS value pathway itself. Um, we will not be doing any kind of, um, or making any kind of assumptions of what, what else should be contributed to your MIPS value pathway score, and we would not aggregate submissions in that sense. You could um, should look at the MVP, select which four measures you intend to report, and um, 
and, and then report those through whatever collection types that are available through the MIPS value pathway. Next slide. We are a small practice reporting Part B, Part B claims measures and our selected MVP doesn't include four quality measures with this collection type. Do we need to report via another collection type as well to meet the quality reporting requirements? And the answer to that is no. We do know that our small practices are uh, the only clinician types that are allowed to report the Medicare Part B claims measures. We've limited that availability to our small practices. So these small practices would meet their quality reporting requirements as long as they report all of the Part B claims measures within the MVP. So that might be fewer than four, and that's okay by us. As long as you report all the Part B claims measures within the MVP, uh, within this example here, you'll see that the small practice is would like to report the rheumatology MVP that we have. And by reporting um, measures 110, 130, and 134 by Medicare Part B claims, um, they would have satisfied the quality reporting requirements because that's the those are the only measures that are available through the um, Medicare Part B collection type. Next slide, please. The only outcome measure available in the emergency medicine MVP is owned by a QCDR and we're not a member of their QCDR. Are we able to report a high priority measure instead or do we have to become a member of the QCDR? No, you can. You don't have to report the outcome measure. If it's not available to you, you can report a high priority measure instead. You are not re required to become a member of a QCDR or work with the QCDR to report a MIPS value pathway. All our MIPS value pathways have been developed in a way that they can be reported without a QCDR. The only exception is you cannot report on the QCDR measures within the MVP without the QCDR. So you would have to work with the QCDR if you're interested in those QCDR measures. But if you're not, and you're looking to report the other measures within the MVP, you do not need to work with the QCDR. It's, it's to your discretion as the clinician. Next slide, please. I'm considering the promoting wellness MVP for my medical group in 2023. I in looking at the quality measures, we've submitted measures based on eCQMs in the past years. I see that the measure so requirements is four quality measures and one of which needs to be an outcome or high priority measure. The only high priority measure is CAPS, which is a survey. Um, and there is a primary person-centered primary care pro-PM measure, which is a high priority measure. Can we submit data two different ways, three measures as eCQMs, one as a MIPS CQM? Yes, you can, within the MVP, as I mentioned before, uh, you'll note that several of our quality measures have various collection times. So, some are available as a CQM, some are available as a QCDR measure, some are available as an eCQM, Part B claims. You can pick and choose which collection types are, uh, you know, the most appropriate for your submission, and you can submit using a combination of collection types to meet the quality reporting requirements. Next slide, please. If we're reporting MIPS as a group, do the quality measures we report have to apply to every provider? For example, we are primarily an oncology practice and we want to report the advancing cancer care MVP. We are adding a rheumatologist to our group, so not all of the MVP quality measures are applicable to that physician. Do we have to select and do we have to select different measures for that physician? The answer is no. The quality measures, the group's quality measures reporting would cover the rheumatologist, even though the rheumatologist doesn't contribute to the quality score. The, the rheumatologist can still participate through the improvement activities and contribute to the promoting interoperability and cost measure performance. However, the intent is that the data that is submitted is ideally attributed to all the clinicians in the group. And so to the extent uh, that is possible and, you know, for example, if the rheumatologist is inter interested in reporting on the rheumatology MVP, we would highly encourage that. That means that they get more, um, you know, granular, more meaningful data that is directly attributed attributable to their practice from the quality perspective, rather than them just um, submitting on the other performance categories. Next slide. Can I still report measures one ten and one eleven? So these measures were ones that we've Part, finalized a partial removal for. And what that means is they're no longer available from traditional in traditional MIPS. They are, however, found within a MIPS value pathway. So you'll note that the measures are found within the rheumatology and kidney health MBPs. Um, and so in this instance, if you were to report 
MVPs. You can find those measures and report on them. But in your, if you're continuing to work through reporting uh, through traditional MIPS, you'll note that those measures are no longer available for you to report. Next slide. Our multi-specialty group is considering submitting traditional MIPS at the group level and registering as a subgroup of cardiologists for the uh, cardiology-related MVP. However, we anticipate the full group will also perform well for that specific measure, for measure 107, sorry, measure 007. Would we be able to submit MIPS CQM 007 as a group as well as a subgroup? Or would be, we be limited to reporting MIPS CQM 007 in only the MVP? So the measure is available in both. Your organization can report um, the measure in traditional MIPS and through the MVP and submit group level data and subgroup level data for the MVP respectively. Uh, when reporting the measure at the group level, it's important that the data is reflective of any clinicians in the group, including those in the subgroup, uh, as applicable based off the, the measure specification. When reporting the measure at the subgroup level, you would only include data that's reflective of those that make up um, your subgroup. Next slide. Okay, uh, more, more, more um, MVP specific examples. So in this one, we have a subset of providers that are looking to report on the lower extremity joint repair MVP as a subgroup. And uh, the remainder of the providers will be reporting traditional MIPS. Um, and there's a specific measure uh, that they are looking to get more guidance on uh, in that um, the BMI measure requires screening once a performance period. How will the denominator work if the patient sees a provider under the subgroup of providers and they're already eligible for BMI under the provider in the TIN who is not in the subgroup? And so here we have more measure specific guidance on how that would work. Um, the measure should be followed for each group and clinician to determine de denominator eligible patients and numerator compliance. I will just note that within all these FAQs, I know we're going through them quickly, um, but it's more so to get to the, the live Q&A um, that we will be sharing these slides. And so with that, you'll get to have a copy of these questions and answers for yourself. I know some of them are very granular and weedy, but the intent was to share them because we've uh, seen the question multiple times. So with that, I'll keep us moving to the next slide. If I qualify for PI reweighting, does that apply to the MVP reporting? Yes, that that the same reweighting policies or uh, PI exemptions that currently exist, exist in traditional MIPS, those are also honored within the MVP space as well. So that's been noted here as well for your reference. Next slide. Can we still submit MIPS PI hardship exemption application if we register to report an MVP? Yep. As I mentioned before, the same exemptions, exceptions, um, capabilities to file for exemptions, um, they still are available through the MVP um, mechanism as they are in traditional MIPS. Next slide. If we're reporting the MVP as a subgroup and traditional MIPS as a group, will the groups promoting interoperability submission be used for the subgroup? Uh, what's important to note here is you must, if you're if you're reporting an MVP as a subgroup, you must submit your group level P PI data um, at the group level. The subgroup must submit that data as a part of their submission. We would not just automatically ap apply the group submission to the subgroup. There has to be a actual physical data submission. The data should be still reflective of the group level. In, in your subgroup submission, but uh, we will not take on the assumption or automatically apply your group level score. We need to actually see the data submission from the subgroup. So I just wanna make sure that part is clear because if we don't receive data on PI from the subgroup, um, then the, the subgroup is gonna receive zero points for that performance category. So please make sure that um, that part is, you're tracking to that part, thank you. Next slide. We registered some of our clinicians to report an MVP as a subgroup and our group qualifies for PI reweighting. Does the subgroup need to report PI data? 
No. So if you're if you're a part of a group and your group is uh, qualified for the reweighting, then it automatically trickles down to your subgroup, and you don't need to report that data. Next slide. The improvement activity requirement for MVP is a participant must submit one of the following options, one high-weighted activity, two medium-weighted, or the IAPCMH activity. If a participant registers to report an MVP, but by the time of submission window closes has submitted only one medium-weighted improvement activity, the participant has not met the submission requirement for the MVP. Is this correct? Yes. So if you've only attested to one medium-weighted activity, then you'll earn 20 out of the 40 points, meaning you've only done half the requirements. Uh, the expectation is if you submit medium weighted activities that you do too in order to get the full 40 points. Next slide. For group MVP reporting, does 50% of the group have to perform the activity like tr in traditional MIPS? And the answer is yes, that same threshold applies to group and subgroup reporting as well. Next slide. Do small practices for or rural and HIPSA practices get two times the points for IAs like in traditional MIPS? No. So when reporting the MVP, everyone gets 20 points for medium weighted activities and 40 points for high weighted activities. If we can't be scored on the cost measures in the MVP, will cost be reweighted? Yes, that's correct. So if you can't be scored on the cost measures, then your cost gets reweighted to quality. And um, you, you'll be, re cost gets assigned the weight zero. How are subgroups evaluated on the cost measures? So as currently finalized, subgroups will be evaluated on the cost measures at the affiliated group level. So that means that we'll calculate the cost measures based on the all the clinicians in the group as appropriate to the measure and not just the clinicians in the subgroup. So if the group cannot be calculated on the, on the cost measure, then, there's, then they cannot be uh, given a score on any of the cost measures in the MVP, the same would happen with the subgroup. And so then they would be reweighted re to um, quality. But if they can, if the group can be calculated on a cost measure within the MVP, that group level score will, will be assigned to the subgroup. We will be calculating all of our administrative claim space measures, which is our cost measures and some of our quality measures and population health measures at the group level. Next slide, please. What final score do I need to avoid a negative payment adjustment? So this is um, the same across traditional MIPS, MIPS value pathways, and the APP reporting. The current threshold is at 75 points. So in order to achieve a neutral, you must achieve a 75 point uh, final score. Next slide. What final score will I receive if I report both traditional MIPS or the APP and the MVP? So as I mentioned before, you would receive the higher of, we, that's the policy we take on. So we would calculate each of those scores separately. And um, then uh, you would, you, whichever score reaches the highest, is the highest we, we would assign to you as your final score. So for example, you report an MVP as a part of a subgroup and the subgroup gets a final score of 77. Meanwhile, your group practice reports traditional MIPS and gets a final score of 82, then we would uh, say your final score is at 82, which is the higher of the two that's are available to your 10 NPI combination. Next slide, please. Will the quality performance category denominator be reduced for small practices and individual clinicians to exclude the population health measures? So if the population health measures cannot be calculated, then yes, they will be, the denominator will be reduced accordingly for those um, who cannot um, be calculated on those measures. So we do ask as a part of MVP registration for your awareness that you register and select which I mean, population health measure you would ideally like to be, you know, if you were to be calculated on which one you would select and to be attributed to your score. Then when we go through the process of actually doing the calculations, if we find that we cannot actually <clears throat> calculate the, cal the, the population health measure, if you're an individual clinician or a smaller practice, then you will, um, or even if you're a larger practice too, uh, then your denominator would be reduced associ asso associated to that um, inability to calculate the measure. Next slide. 
how are quality measures scored in MVP reporting? Um, they are scored in, in alignment with how they are scored in traditional MIPS. So for quality measures, there are zero points awarded for measures that don't meet data completeness, with the exception for our small practices who are given three points, zero points for measures that don't complete, don't have uh, meet case minimum requirements or don't have a benchmark, uh, with the exception of small practices that have three points assigned to those measures. And the only other thing is if there are new measures in, in our MVPs or um, even in traditional MIPS, there's a there's a seven and a five point four for new measures in their first and second year of life in the program, respectively. So those are the minimums that would be achieved for for new measures. Overall, though, the scale for uh, potential to achieve points goes from one to ten points for measures that can be reliable, reliably scored against a benchmark. Um, for the population health measures, in addition to the four required quality measures, those can also be achieved from one to 10 points if they can be reliably scored against a benchmark, or alternatively, if they cannot be calculated, they'd be excluded from scoring if you don't meet those requirements. Next slide. We are planning to report the improving care for lower extremity joint repair MVP, as this is applicable to a large subset of our surgeons. If you report this MVP as a group, do all of our providers receive that score? Yes. So if you report as a group, the entire, the score will apply to everyone in your TIN. Um, all the clinicians in the practice get the group's final score and associated payment adjustment unless they have a higher score from an individual or an APM an entity participation option, or if they, choose to also participate in traditional MIPS, that, that's taken into consideration as well. Do third-party intermediaries need to support all the MVPs available for 2023? No. Those that, the third-party intermediaries should be supporting MVPs that are the most clinically attributable and meaningful to their, to the clients they support. That, so that doesn't mean, um, we're not trying to be prescriptive that you must support all MVPs or, a certain number of MEPs is really dependent on your clientele as a third-party intermediary. Um, so we look to you to determine what that could be. That could be one, that could be several MVPs. It's really kind of contingent on your the makeup of the clients that you support as a third-party intermediary, or if you support multi-specialty groups. We do know that there are some third-party intermediaries that are dedicated to a single specialty or a subspecialty area. Uh, so it would not be appropriate to then re require that they support all MVPs because that would mean they would support measures that are not attributable to their uh, clinicians. So we do want to uh, offer that flexibility and make sure that's clear that that flexibility exists. Um, one thing to note that is if you have an MVP that you are supporting as a third party intermediary and um, you are expected to support the reporting of all quality measures with the, within the MVP, with the exception of CAPS, which can only be reported through a CAPS survey vendor, QCDR measures, which only can be reported by QCDRs. Um, the other side note with that is, as a QCDR measure owner, um, you know the underlying ex expectation is you would support the measures that you own. Yeah, but there's no um, expectation that other QCDRs must seek permission to use those QCDR measures in order to support the MVP. They could choose to report support all the other measures in the MVP, the MIPS quality measures, and not the QCDR measures necessarily. It's to their discretion. I think we would only um, just advise that you be clear of what you intend to support from the QCDR measure standpoint within your um, um offerings to your clients so that they're aware as they prepare for future reporting. Um, and um, additionally, the expectation is that uh, for IAs and the promoting interoperability performance category that uh, the third party intermediaries are able to support the options that are available in the IA section of the MVP for all, uh, for all MVPs and that they are able to support generally the reporting of PI. Um, the only and the other last thing to mention is our uh, additional expectation for those third party intermediaries that support MVPs is that they should also be able to support the reporting of uh, subgroups. So if subgroups are choosing to form and report through a third party intermediary, the third party inter intermediary who supports MVP should be able to support MVP report, subgroup reporting as well. Next slide, please. 
Is data submission for MVPs different from third-party intermediaries? Generally, it's going to be the same. The only thing that's different uh, is that you not only have to register for MVP reporting, but there will be an MVP ID required for MVP reporting and a subgroup identifier. So for those subgroups that register, once your registration has been approved, you'll be given a unique identifier to distinguish your submission from your TIN submission. And um, that's important so that we could associate the submission at the subgroup level to the to the um, the appropriate clinicians within the TIN. And uh, with it, with that, there's also going to be MVPs IDs that are assigned to each MVP that we've implemented. Uh, and it's important that the MVP identifier is included as well when you submit your data, so we can clearly tie your submission to a MIPS value pathway. Next slide, please. Can we submit our quality data from multiple sources or data slash data sets such as QRDA and JSON? Yes, similar to, similar to traditional MIPS, you can submit your quality data from multiple data source, sources or sets to meet your reporting requirements. But just make sure that you, as I mentioned before, include the appropriate identifiers as necessary. So your MVP identifiers, if you're a subgroup, your subgroup identifiers are also important as well. Next slide. Will we use the same JSON format and structure when submitting an MVP as in traditional MIPS? Yes, the, the format and structures are the same. Um, as I mentioned before, the identifiers are what is what what is different. So you have to just make sure you include your MVP identifier and subgroup identifier as, as necessary. Next slide. How do I distinguish an MVP submission from traditional MIPS or the APP? Um, and we went over the identifier already, so we'll move to the next one. If, if the MVP ID is appended to a claim, does the claim does the clinician still have to register for the MVP? Yes. MVP registration is required regardless of how you submit. You need to register in order to be able to submit. Uh, it's important that you note that once that deadline closes on November 30th, you will no longer be able to register for MVP submission. So it's important that even if you're considering it, that you at least get your registration in by the deadline so you have your options available to you and you have some time to then decide if you choose to submit MVPs or then choose to go back to traditional MIPS and submit that instead, um, at least you have your options open up too. But if you wait till after the November 30th deadline and try to register for an MVP, you, you won't be able to. Next slide. Okay, and I'll turn it back over to the Ketchum team so we can start our, our live Q&A. Yeah, thanks, Fia. So before we do start the Q&A, we're just gonna talk about the best place to get help. So next slide, please. All right, so for practice or facility specific questions, please do contact the QPP Service Center, which is available Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern and can be contacted by email at qpp at cms.hhs.gov by phone at 1-866-288-8292 or by opening a QPP Service Center ticket. And then finally, people who are deaf or hard of hearing can dial 711 to be connected to a TRS communications assistant. Next slide, please. Okay, so we are now gonna start the Q&A portion of the webinar. Uh, before I do though, I do just wanna uh, remind everyone that a recording of today's webinar, uh, as well as a copy of the slides, which will include all the hyperlinks you saw on screen today, will be available on the QBP webinar library within the coming weeks. Okay, so on to the Q&A. Uh, if you do have a question, you can ask it through either the Q&A box, uh, as many of you have already been doing, or through the webinar audio. And to ask a question through the webinar audio, please raise your hand and we will unmute your line so that you can speak. Uh, you may also need to unmute yourself as well, but we'll prompt you to do that. It seems like you're double muted. Um, and then finally, we do want to emphasize that questions asked today should specifically focus on MVPs. Okay, so we are going to actually start by turning our attention over to the audio. And Melissa Prey, we have just unmuted your line. Uh, feel free to ask your question whenever you're ready. Melissa, you may need to unmute yourself. Okay. 
All right, so we're going to go on to somebody else. Uh, Faison Varani, we have just unmuted your line. Um, if you have a question, please go ahead and ask it. Okay. All right, on to another caller. Uh, Rick Gwenda, we've unmuted your line. Feel free Thank to you. ask your question. All right, yep, we can hear you. Thank you. Yep, can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. So in 2024, there is a proposed new MSK MVP that would be applicable for physical therapists. And looking at it, I see there are 10 quality measures with seven of them being photo. So I just want to make sure I understand this. So if a physical therapy practice wants to do the MSK MVP, but they do not have photo, they don't use photo, there's only three measures they could report on. Is it a safe assumption then that they would not want to do that MVP since they would be penalized since they are not doing at least four of the quality measures because they can't do it because they're not using photo? Does that make sense? Yes. When you say photo, you're referring to the, the MIPS quality measures that are have been developed by photo, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so ideally, so the way MIPS quality reporting would work for MVPs is yes, for any unreported measure that would result in a zero out of 10 for the unreported measure. So I would highly suggest, Rick, to the extent possible, I know for this uh, proposed MVP, we are in the midst of rulemaking, please submit comments, uh, if you could, in the, in the formal comment process. Um, that would help uh, us internally with our, uh, you know, in figuring out how to uh, observe those scenarios and if there are uh, changes that need to be made. Um, having your public comments submitted formally would help us kind of talk through that a bit further internally and what can be done. Thank you. We'll do so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay. We're going to go take a look at the Q&A box to see if anyone has submitted a question. Um, just as a reminder, please do be sure to submit your questions and we will answer them. Okay. So. I'm not seeing any questions at the moment. So we are actually going to go back to the audio. Rachel Groman, we've unmuted your line. Hi, uh, Sophia. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for hosting this. This is very um, informative. Um, I, I did submit through the q and I don't know, maybe it was missed. But um, if a population health measure is selected by a group when they're registering for an MVP and it ends up they don't meet the case minimum, so it's it's not scorable, can CMS then still try to see if the other population health measure is applicable or, or would they only potentially be held accountable to the one they signed up for? At this point, um, hey, Rachel, at this point, uh, they would only uh, be, be, we would only look at them from the perspective of the, the population health may, they register, the population health measure they registered for. Um, and uh, if it could not be calculated, then that would just result in the denominator reduction. Um, but, you know, um, there could be a future state where that changes. But for, for at this point, uh, we, we um, by policy, um, would, would then reduce their denominator um, if we could not calculate the measure. Okay, thank you. No problem. Okay, so we're going to take a look at the Q&A box. We have a question that reads, can a practice submit more than four MVP measures to meet the threshold? Yes. So um, if you register for an MVP and uh, in in MVP for quality, you, you are only required to submit four measures. But if you submit more than four, then similar to what happens in traditional MIPS when you submit more than six, we would take the higher of. So you would still need to meet the requirement of of the four measures, one needs to be an outcome or a high priority measures, but then um, we would look to see how you did in each of the individual measures within the MVP that you've submitted for, and then take the higher of to, to then make your, um, your final score for MVP quality reporting. Great. Okay, so another question asks, can you submit MVP measures 
slash data from both the QCDR and a qualified data registry. That is a good question. I, I'm going to ask if anyone from the team wants to take that one on. It's more, a bit more technical. Stephen, I see you're on. Do you mind uh, fielding this one? Maybe we can come back to the question, Matt. I think that's something we I need like a product person to answer. Sure. Okay, so the next question we have is, when will we know when the proposed 2024 MVPs will be approved? Um, right now, the rule pub proposed rules out for public comment, which ends on September 11th. So highly encourage uh, our uh, attendees today to comment to the extent they are interested in doing so. And um, the the final rule will be re uh, will uh, release in the fall, in sometime in the fall. I, I I don't have an exact date to share with you, unfortunately. But uh, once we receive the public comments, which the pu public comment period ending September 11th, uh, we will go through our typical processes. And in the fall, later this fall, we'll release the final rule, which will then give you uh, where we our final deter determinations for each of our policy areas. And in this case, whether or not we finalize certain MVPs or MVP updates. Great. Okay. We'll do one more from the Q&A box and then we'll go back over to the audio. This question asks, do MVP quality measures use the same benchmarks as traditional MIPS measures? Yes, they do. Uh, does anyone want to jump in there? Take this one. I can repeat it if that'd be helpful. Hey, Matt. Sorry, I, I answered it. I said, yes, they do. They use the same benchmarks. Okay. All right, great. So I think we're going to go back over to the phone lines. Uh, Ms. Masri Dutt, we have unmuted you. So feel free to ask your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So uh, we have identified an MVP uh, to report for 2023, but our EHR vendor says that they don't support that MVP. However, we have identified the four ECQMs that we can report from. So is there any implication for the EHR vendor not supporting that MVP? Like, can we generate QRDA tree file for the four ECQMs and enter PI and IA data directly on QPP? Hi, yes, I believe that is possible, but again, I would prefer our product team members into this. Stephen, are you on? I think Stephen is having problems with his audio, yeah, but we I, actually, oh, I'm, there. I'm, I'm here. Do you, do you mind repeating the question? Sorry, I couldn't find the window. Um, no worries. Um, so, we have identified an MVP that we want to report for PY 2023. And we have identified the four, actually we have five ECQMs that we can report from, from that MVP. But that each vendor is, um, they mentioned that they don't support that MVP. So I just want to understand what are the implications of that? Like, can we just generate the QRDA files for those ECQMs and upload that on QPP along with the PI and IA data. Is there any problem with the Asia vendor not supporting that MVP if we report on that? So it is possible to do what you're saying um, with one of the caveats being, you wanna make sure that if you're pulling down the data, um, when you do translate it, um, you can use the conversion tool that we have that is a node on um, our preview documentation um, that would convert the QRDA3 into the QPP JSON. And then you would want to make sure that you're using the correct program name, um, which would be the MVP identifier as part of the upload. Um, or if you're going in and modifying the uh, QRDA3 directly, then you would go in and change the information for the program that you're reporting within the, the header content in the XML document. Okay, okay. So, um, can somebody be, uh, please post that link to that document? For which one? I'm sorry. 
for the conversion. Uh, I understand we have to add the MVP ID on the file that we submit, correct? It would, yeah, and that's in the QRDA3 implementation guide if you are modifying the XML directly. Um, okay. So if, you, if that's the direction you want to go, you could upload the QRDA3 file um, as long as you modify the information in there and then upload the other um, measure that you are reporting via if it's the QPP JSON um, and we would merge and score based on the two different submissions. We are actually thinking of submitting all through eCQMs. Um, you would need to combine them all into a single file if you are doing that, um, because if you upload both of them from the same um, same source, what will happen is it will overwrite um, whatever one you have uploaded first. So just okay. make sure that you're you're cautious on how you're uploading your data in order to get it in there correctly. Got it. Thank you. Okay, uh, Kieran Corth. We've just unmuted your line. So whenever you're ready, please go ahead and ask your question. Okay, so my question is going to lean a little bit on Rick Kawanda's previous question about a proposed MVP on rehabilitated support for musculoskeletal care. And, but my question, goes back to your uh, slide on if you are only going to report the claims measures uh, within the quality category of that MVP. Does EMMA apply? With, within the perspective, hi Karen and Sophia, within the perspective of MIPS value pathways, we do not have M EMMA. EMMA does not exist in, in the MIPS value pathway policies. Um, but uh, within when it comes to, I assume you're referring to the Medicare Part B claims measures within right. within the MIPS value pathways. Those are only available to our small practices, and right. the the only uh, rule essentially is that as a small practice, you only have to report all the Medicare Part B claims measures, which may be four or fewer than four within the MIPS value pathway. We won't have Emma available to then um, you know, do any kind of validation. Um, so for if there are, for example, three Medicare Part B claims measures and, and the practice only reports two of them, then for the unreported measure, they would achieve a zero out of 10. Okay, but as long as they report all of the claims measures that are available in there, um, they'll get scored according to the number of claims measures that are available for them. Correct. Yes. Thank, so thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think we're going to go back to the Q&A box. Um, we do have a question that asks, uh, knowing all MVPs have a mix of ECQM and abstracted quality measures, will this change by 2026? Otherwise, there is an additional cost since our organization uses ECQMs and does not co contract with, uh, with a registry. Uh, we have not set any timeline or intention to, I assume that was referring to moving to all ECQMs within the MIPS value pathway um, by 2026. We have not set any type of timeline with regards to digital measurement at this point yet, um, because there are larger bodies of work that are occurring associated with that that are, are you know, a bit more time consuming and take a bit more time to implement. Um, but from the perspective of the available collection types within the MIPS value pathway, there is no um, there is no underlying assumption that you must work with the third party intermediary. You could if you would like to, but we would like to leave the choice up to the clinicians and their practices. Um, the MVPs have been developed in a way that they can be reported without a third party intermediary. So even those CQM measures, um, they can be reported. Uh, there are file formats and means. I think uh, we have a lot of more technical resources available in our QPP resource library that kind of walk you through how that those type of data, that type of data for CQM measures can be submitted directly from the practice. So you, you don't necessarily have to work with the third party intermediary. Certainly there are definitely um, 
pros to doing so in that, you know, they have, um, they provide you with a bit more support and um, feedback and, and things like that. But uh, we do know that there's costs associated with using a third party intermediary and did not want to um, uh, require clinicians to have to work through them in order to report a MIPS value pathway. So just wanted to be clear that those measures that exist within the MVP outside of your ECQMs that need to be reported through an EHR and your QCDR measures that must be reported through a QCDR and the CAPS measure, all other measures can be reported without a third party intermediary. Great. Okay. We have another question that asks, is there an advantage to reporting as two subgroups with two MVPs instead of one group and one MVP? I think the I think the advantage or the the benefit of it is that you you get more granular data when you form more meaningful subgroups that are kind of uh a bit more granular and having those them select and register for MVPs that are more meaningful to their day-to-day -day practice. So in that sense, not only do the clinicians within each of those respective subgroups get more data that's more clinically relevant to them, they can, you know, make maybe more, you know, if, if they need to make improvements in the care they provide, they have that opportunity based off of data that they submitted. But then, you know, at the, at the other side of things, when you when you look at it from the patient perspective, they have more um, attributable data that is directly related to, for example, specialists and the type of care they provide, and and they can make more meaningful decisions about the care they uh, the care they receive by the specialists that are involved in the care they receive. So I think that you know definitely the intentions with subgroup data to get more granular reporting are there to make quality reporting more meaningful because as we've noted with large group practices when we receive submissions of large group practices for the most part they're not necessarily submitting data that represents or is clinically attributable to every clinician within their large practice it's difficult to do so and you know there might be a number of specialties within within a given large practice so highly encourage the utilization of subgroups to the extent uh, groups can before it becomes mandatory in 2026 for MVP reporting. Um, that way you can familiarize yourself with those policies and operations. Great. Okay. I think we're going to do one more from the Q&A box before we go back over to the phone lines. And this question asks, what well, says, I do not understand quality measures with no benchmarks, with options for submissions. It seems to be unfairly punitive to receive zero points because there is no benchmark. Am I misunderstanding something? So in instances where we don't receive enough data, we cannot actually establish a benchmark. So without the data to establish a benchmark and then have um, meaningful comparisons between clinicians, it's hard to actually assign points to those measures. Um, so for that reason, those we've had in place, and it's not necessarily a, a, a MVP policy, it's a general MIPS policy that we've had for years. These policies that require um, data to be submitted, uh, case minimums to be met, um, it's sufficient data to be re received in order for us to actually establish benchmarks. And then for within the benchmarks, we establish deciles. And that's all really based on the volume of data received, uh, the data completeness with that data and how we can compare uh, clinicians' performance and then, you know, set these dense deciles accordingly. So it, it, it becomes difficult to just assign points for very, very little data that is received for a given measure, which is why we have this policy in place to, um, you know, in a sense where we don't have enough data um, received that we then assign the zero out of 10 or for new measures, we have those, those floors that exist, um, as of, I believe last year, but I would say, I, because within the MIPS value pathway, you have choices as to the avail, which measures you select and report on within quality that you, if you've been historically reporting in MIPS, you probably have an idea of the areas where you, you feel like you have sufficient data. And I would highly also encourage you to take a look at you know, past year's benchmarking files as well to see whether your measure you're interested in has an established benchmark to then make more informed decisions about which measures you want to pursue for quality reporting purposes in MIPS and MVPs. 
Great. Okay. So we are going to go back to the audio. Brian Gale, we have unmuted your line. So go ahead and ask your question whenever you're ready. You may need to unmute yourselves. Are you able to hear much? Are you able to hear me? Yep. Loud and clear. So um, what I wrote was if some uh, members of a group or of a practice or 10 are able to report an MVP and others are ineligible and the non-eligible physicians to elect to report as a group, uh, could they use the reporting, the MVP reporting as part of the group reporting that to help them meet their data sufficiency, data completeness, sorry. Um, hi, Brian. Uh, Hello. So from the, per, I, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm trying to, sorry, piecemeal your question a little bit. Um, so from the perspective of, for example, subgroup reporting, our expectation for subgroups to report is bottom line is at least one clinician within the subgroup has to be MIPS eligible. Um, we don't have an MVP reporting right now. We don't have voluntary or opt-in reporting. So from your perspective of uh, you have a subset of clinicians that are MIPS eligible, but then the rest of the TIN is not. Right. Um, uh, as long as you if the group is deemed MIPS eligible, then they can participate as a group. If the group's not deemed as MIPS eligible, I believe that they would leverage some of the other alternatives and participation options, whether that be individual or subgroup reporting to report as they choose to. Well, no, my in my example, they are the rest of the group is MIPS eligible. They're just not eligible oh, to report the MVP. Oh, so, I see. Okay. So what I'm wondering is, can they use the MVP reporting to help meet data completeness? for the group? Uh, help use the MVP to meet data completeness. So for example, so, if there's a given, if there's a quality measure that's mm -hmm. reported by the MVP subgroup, would that reporting count as part of the overall group reporting for the TIN and contribute to data completeness? We would not automatically uh, make that attri attribution, Brian. So what would have to happen is you could, you know, the clinicians within the subgroup, the data they submit to us separately as a subgroup, they could still use that same data set and submit it as a part of the larger group when the group does their submission. But oh, we I would, see. We would not make that. Uh, so it'd be a separate, they'd have to just submit it twice. Right, exactly. Thank you. It, it wouldn't be an automatic attribution thing. Yeah, um, and, and to caveat on that, um, if you are reporting MVP um, subgroup information, it's considered a completely separate submission object um, and entity level object. So there is no type of um, comparison or any type of aggregation between the objects. So if you're reporting at one level, uh, make sure you are reporting all of the categories that are required at that level. Um, and, and, you know, in your example, if you're reporting for the group, um, you would need to report all of the information for the group that needs to be reported. Anything that's not reported that is required would result in a score of zero um, for the category. Thank you. Okay, so now we are going to go over to Alexander Galvin. Uh, we have just unmuted your line. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, this is specific to the uh, rheumatology MVP, where the, the quality measures have a lot of kind of restrictions and where they are can only earn up to seven points. If a practice of mine does not is not connected to the QCDR um, rise, that limits their ability to kind of report on quality measures that earn up to 10 points. So with that being said, if most of their measure, if they are meeting most of their measures, but most of them are seven point measures, that would limit their ability to earn the full 40 points. Would you recommend not doing MVPs for that if that is the case then? Um, in that sense, hey, hi, Alexander. In that sense, I would one strongly suggest uh, to the extent um, you could submit any comments on the rheumatology MVP 
as it pertains to the concerns that you've mentioned here, I think that would be very helpful. I would flag that, you know, to your to your point of if there are concerns related to the availability of additional MIPS quality measures with the 10 point capability, um, you could also submit on the MBP and then submit traditional MIPS uh, separately. And that would allow, again, which within traditional MIPS, as you're aware, there's a larger inventory of measures that are available to your for your use. And, and you, you know, the clinicians can select the measures accordingly that you know may not have necessarily the seven point cap, or at least, you know, have more opportunities to include measures with the 10 point floor. Um, and you know, certainly both both submissions, your MVP submission and then your traditional MIPS submission would be calculated. Uh, we would take the higher of the two. So, so then in that sense, the, you know, the clinicians have that opportunity to, uh, you know, possibly observe, achieve a higher score based off of how they do on each of those submissions. All right. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to go back to the Q&A box. We do have a question that asks, do the QRDA3 files have to have the MVP ID mentioned on them? Yes. If you are reporting to an MVP and or reporting to a subgroup, you want to make sure that your QRDA3 file is structured correctly. Um, if it does not contain MVP ID or if it does not contain the subgroup structured correctly in ter terms of the header reporting, um, either the file will fail validation or if you're reporting as a group, it will not be going towards the MVP. Um, so you want to make sure you're following the implementation guide um, related to the format and structure of both of those components when you are reporting to QPP. Great, thanks. Okay, so our next question asks, if an MVP has been developed and finalized, but quality measures that are more robust and applicable are developed in the future, could those be used in place of the current quality measures or would a new MVP need to be developed? Uh, we we have an MVP maintenance process that we've established in, in rulemaking in, in the past. And so with that, you can, um, for our, any of our existing MVPs that been, have been previously finalized, you can submit recommendations of if there are newer measures as an example that you feel we should include, or if there are measures that should be you know, replaced or possibly removed. And similar, similarly with the improvement activities and cost measures as well, you could submit those recommendations through the process. Um, I believe we have, uh, on our QPP resource library, a specific page dedicated to MVP and MVP development and maintenance with additional guidance on how, how you can provide that feedback. But that feedback is really helpful uh, for us to then make sure that if through our MVP maintenance process, we're including the most clinically relevant measures. So year over year, uh, we we tend to review all the MVPs we've previously finalized. And, and that's when those, those recommendations would really come in handy. Uh, so to the extent you observe that we newer measures are being proposed for inclusion in the program and you feel like they need they should be included in the MVP or replace a given existing measure, um, really do highly encourage that you provide that feedback as, the, as that will kind of um, give us items to track to for future rulemaking purposes. Thank you. Great. Okay, so we're going to go back to the phone line now to Madison. Madison Huddleston, we've just unmuted your line. So go ahead and ask your question whenever you're ready. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I did ask a question in the Q&A. Um, again, for the MP, MVP pathways, we are a small practice. So we are pretty limited in the number of ECQMs that are applicable to us. Um, we're a single specialty clinic. Um, so if we choose the only MVP pathway that applies to us, Unfortunately, our, um, e our EHR system only is certified to report on two to three of those measures predicted by the end of this year that's in the MVP pathway. Is there an exception for 
EHR certification. I did hear um, Stephen speaking a lot about um, the Excel file and being able to modify that and um, all kind of all those IT resources. What he said that the pros um, in reporting might be able to help with that. Is there any more information on that? <laughs> Um, so, because our EHR just is not, we just, we can't collect data for certain measures. So we won't be able to meet and we'll get zeros on all those quality measures. Is there any exception for MVP for small practice or anything like so, that? So, uh, I, I can't answer from the technical standpoint, Madison, but from the from the policy standpoint, uh, uh, the the other collection type that's available, if if you are you know your practice is so interested in you know utilizing the Medicare Part B claims measures, if there are any in the MVP that you've identified as clinically relevant, because if there are fewer than four, then that's all you're required to report. So, for example, if only two of those measures are specified as a Medicare Part B claims measures, you would submit that you know that would require some level of intervention from your practice in, in terms of submitting something to us physically, but um, the reporting requirements is possibly fewer because you are a small practice. Um, okay. So I would take a look at the collection types and see, you know, how many measures are available through the Part B claims measures and if those measures are clinically pertinent to your, to your practice and the feasibility of gathering that data. Um, but I, I, I for I'm not sure if there are from the technical side additional resources Stephen you want to flag. Yeah, that's that's what I was going to say, Sophia. I agree. Um, if you're having issues, Part B is really the resource that would be available for small practices um, in terms of support from the XML files and, and getting those into the format that's required. Um, really, the only thing that is available is the implementation guide that would show you where the, um, the correct UUIDs would need to be applied for reporting. Um, but that's really the extent of the, the data information for um, creating those files. OK. All right, thank you, guys. Okay, Rick Gawanda, we have just unmuted your line. So feel free to ask your question when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, if a practice participates in MVP in 2024 and the, both the PI and the cost category are reweighted, would it still be for small practices 50% quality and 50% improvement activity? And then for non small practices, 85 quality, 15 improvement activity? just like it is for traditional MIPS? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So we're gonna give it a few minutes. I don't see anyone else with their hand raised or any other questions that have popped up in the Q&A box. Just as a reminder, you know, a, a question that popped up that Sophia had mentioned, um, that I wasn't able to get off of mute for. I don't know if we want to go back and revisit that one, um, like potentially provide oh, an answer. I think that was, yeah, I think, Matt, it was the question related to whether we were able to aggregate a submission, Stephen, that was from a QCDR and a qualified registry for a single MVP. Yes, um, as long as the entities are different, um, then it would result in the ability to aggregate information into a single submission method. Um, again, just making sure that you're not uploading files that where you are the same user um, or the same organization, because in that instance, it will result in overwriting the initial file. Um, but as long as the organizations are different, that should not be an issue. And they would have to make sure they assign the appropriate identifiers, right? Yep, yep. Yeah, making sure that you're you're uh, reporting the information at the correct level, as well as assigning the correct entity or the correct program name for uh, the MVP that you are reporting. Great. Okay, so we do have a few more that popped up. 
One asks, hi, can you clarify, is uh, Part B claim submission an option for the MVP program? Hi, yes, it is, but it's only available to our small practices. I, I can I can reread that question if you'd like. Oh, Matt, can you hear me? So the question yeah, I, I heard you. Yeah. Oh, yep. Okay. Yes. I I just what I mentioned was that yes, the Part B claims option collection type is available through MIPS Valley Pathways. You'd have to look carefully at each of the measures within the quality component of the MIPS Valley Pathway to see where the Part B claims option is available. Um. And as I, as we've mentioned earlier, just note that, you know, if there are fewer than four measures within the, a given MVP that have the Part B claim collection type available, that's all the small practice is required to report. Um, but just want to flag that only small practices can report on the Part B claims measures. And, and also um, make sure that you are including um, the program or the MVP ID on your claims um, during the year. So that way we can identify that you are reporting to the MVP program, um, who's the secondary item associated with what Sophia was saying. Thanks, okay. So another one asks, can a group or individual provider report all three performance categories for an MVP through different entities? For example, can an individual or group report quality through QCDR and promoting interoperability and improvement activities through their EHR and vice versa? Are there any restrictions here? This would go back to um, essentially the same way that QPP works right now, um, just making sure that you are reporting all of the information with um, the correct MVP ID as well as the correct um, level for which you are reporting. We, we will not be combining any type of submission methods between you know, subgroup to group. There won't be any type of, um, if you try to report to the subgroup and you don't have the correct um, MVP ID, the submission would be rejected. Um, but if you are reporting, you know, let's say you go in and you report IA manually and you have your um, EHR that uploads your PI file and then you, your QR that reports your quality information as long as it's all reported correctly following the guidelines to the correct program, um, it will result in a score for the entity that you are reporting for. Great, thanks. Okay, so we do have another one. This one asks if MVP eCQMs are aggregated as QRDA3 and CQMs as JSON, will the two files overwrite each other when uploading to the QPP portal? It would be contingent, again, on who is reporting um, as well as what submission method you're using. If you are reporting one as electronic health record and the other one is utilizing the CQMs, um, since those are different collection types, they would not override each other. Um, if you are reporting all as one um, collection method, then you would want to make sure that you um, put it into one file um, for upload to ensure that there is no type of overriding or unintentional overriding of submission data. Um, thank you. Okay, so this one. Next question asks, we are a radiology specialty and currently there isn't an MVP for radiology. Uh, could we potentially report on another MVP instead? You would have to find an MVP that is clinically relevant and appropriate for your practice. So if there is one available, certainly, you know, you are you're welcome to report it. But until, you know, if, if there isn't one available, you are also uh, welcome to re continuously report traditional MIPS or the APP as that's applicable to. Great, thanks. This, this next question asks, um, MVP is optional until when? We have not set a date for what I assume you're referring to the potential future state where we've 
uh, flagged in the past that we, we will likely sunset traditional MIPS. We have not uh, indicated when that will be. Just know that when we um, get to a point where we're ready to identify a year, uh, that will be done through notice and comment rulemaking. We will propose the sunset of traditional MIPS and then certainly um, do that through the rulemaking process with the intention of getting to a point where once we sunset traditional MIPS, whatever year that might be, that uh, MVP reporting would eventually become mandatory because traditional MIPS no longer exists. Great, okay, so this next one asks, can we report all four ECQMs through the same QRDA3 XML file with adding MVP ID in the header? Yep. Um, again, it, it would go back to very similar to the way that you are reporting data to, to MIPS, um, a single file with the measures that are required as long as the, the file is formatted correctly and you are registered, um, that will work and be stored and scored as expected. Great. Okay, so we do have another one. This one asks, um, can a participant in an ACO also report on MVPs? Yes. Um, again, this, this would go back to um, the eligibility associated with the individual um, and what level you're wishing to actually register. Um, but that is an option as well. And Stephen, just a layer on, um, this is Maura, if, um, because the shared savings program ACOs are required to report the APP, an individual clinician in the ACO who registers to report the MVP would then get two final scores and they'd be assigned the higher of the two, either from the ACO's APP reporting or their individual MVP reporting. Thanks, okay. Um, so it looks like we are out of questions in the Q&A box. I mean, we still do have plenty of time. So if you have questions, please go ahead and send them in. Uh, we'll give it a few more minutes. Um, if you'd like to answer your question through audio, please raise your hand and you know we'll unmute you so that you can ask your question. Stephen, do you uh, do you mind mentioning where uh, our attendees can find information related to the file formats um, for the QRDA or the JSON um, within our QPP resource library? I think there are some questions on if there is interest in uh, submitting CQM measures without using a third party intermediary. How do they get more information on that? Uh, yes, absolutely. So the Data related to the CQM format would be on the resource library. If you go to developer tools um, in there, there is the documentation associated with the API. Um, so there will be information that will be available there that will show how the um, submission should be structured as well as what the program name is um, and where it should be located within the submission. And then I see that um, Lindsay did post the location for the ECQI um, QRDA3 implementation guide, um, but there will be some more um, tutorial type information for um, reporting to the CQMs um, on the API documentation um, within QPP, which I'll post that link in the chat as well. Great. Okay, so we do have a few questions that popped up. One asks, what is an example of a third-party intermediary? So the third-party intermediaries include our qualified clinical data registries, or what we refer to as QCDRs. Our qualified registries, um, our health IT vendors, those include our EHR uh, platforms, 
that we receive data from. And then also uh, we have what's called a, a CAPS, which is a um, patient-centered survey measure. And so we have a CAP survey vendor, and um, they are also considered a, a third-party intermediary that submits data on behalf of clinicians. So those are the four intermediaries that could submit data on, on a clinician or group's behalf. We don't, uh, aside from the QCDR measures and the CAPS measure, which require um, those submissions to come for the, from those type of intermediaries and the ECQMs should come from an EHR, we don't require um, you know, uh, clinicians to necessarily use these intermediaries. It's to their discretion. Certainly, if your group intends to submit on the CAP survey, you have to go through a survey vendor, CAP survey vendor. And likewise, a QCDR measure has to be reported through a QCDR. But um, you know, there is some discretion and flexibility since you um, the clinicians get to choose which measures they want to report to then uh, also possibly report without using a third party, third party intermediary as well. Okay, so we have another question that asks, well, my EHR provides uh, ECQM measures. Can I collect and submit ECQMs through QRDA3 and also submit registry measures through a qualified registry? Yep, that that is an option. Again, just making sure that when you are reporting that the uh, file is structured correctly and contains the correct identifier, to be applied to your MVP reporting. Okay, so this next one asks, will cost score results be different with MVPs? And specifically, this person is wondering if they if the outcome score will be higher. I don't think that's necessarily true. I don't know that there's necessarily a difference. The only difference you the, the state, same type of rules of how a cost score can be achieved in traditional MIPS, meaning you have to meet certain thresholds and, you know, the measure act has to be able to uh, meet certain case minimums in order to be calculated. Those those still, those still rules still apply in MIPS value pathway reporting. Um, it's more so that in traditional MIPS, you have a larger library of cost measures and we look to calculate a given clinician, at, you know, against all those measures and see what, what possibly works out versus in an MVP, uh, the number of measures available from the cost perspective are, are limited. So we we kind of condensed it down further within the MIPS value pathway to only include the more clinically relevant cost measures that can be tied to the quality measures within a given MVP. So, um, but from the standpoint of potentially doing better or worse, I don't necessarily know that that can be seen because uh, their requirements are pretty much the same. And we still have, even outside of MIPS value pathways, we still have clinicians in traditional MIPS that would be calculated on those very same measures. Great. Okay, so we do have another one. This one asks, for a large multi-specialty organization with multiple TINs, would each TIN be required to submit one MVP? And then when forming subgroups, would each of these TINs need more than one subgroup submitting an MVP? Sorry, um, Matt, can you just uh, go through the question one more time so I can make sure I track sure. it? Sure, okay. So for a large multi-specialty organization with multiple TINs, would each TIN be required to submit one MVP? And that's the first part of the question. And the second one asks, and then when forming subgroups, would each of these TINs need more than one subgroup submitting an MVP? So each TIN, when submitting MVP, MIPS Valley Pathways, would have to register and uh, register for um, again, from a participation option standpoint, each 10 has options, right? They can report as a 10, they can report as multiple subgroups. If the clinicians within the group would like to report as individuals, they can certainly do so. They'd ha have to complete registration at the appropriate levels. So each 10 within that multi-specialty practice can only report, can only, uh, each clinician can only be attributed to their own MVP registration, they can only report at most one MVP unless they break up into subgroups. So if a TIN 
within that multi-specialty group so it forms two to three subgroups, then each of those subgroups can report on a unique MVP that is more clinically attributable to their practice. Um, as I mentioned before, we don't have more granular subgroup formation criteria. So hypothetically, if that TIN feels that the way in which they currently practice is the most uh, appropriate and that you know they can report an MVP in that manner and it would reflect their performance um, in, a, in an accurate way that you know they can register with the clinicians within their TIN as a, as a subgroup to report that way as well. Um, it's difficult to put forth more stringent subgroup criteria when we know that practices and multi-specialty practices are formed in so many different ways that, uh, you know, it's difficult to say that we can only require X number of clinicians or X number of specialties and, and be very black and white about it. So um, there is some flexibility with the way in which you report. I think we would defer to the practices to make the most, um, to make the decision as to what would be the best and most appropriate way to submit data that would make, ensure that the data can be not just um, clinically relevant to the clinicians, but then also meaningful to the way they which in the way in which they practice as well. Great. Okay. I know we're getting a little bit closer to one o'clock, but just keep keep those questions coming. We still do have plenty of time to respond to them. The next one from the Q&A box asks, do EHRs have to support all quality measures in an MVP if they support an MVP category, or do they only have to support the ECQMs within an MVP category to say they support that MVP category? Generally, if a, if a third party, sorry, if a third party intermediary says they support an MVP, the expectation, as I mentioned before, is they support the three performance categories that require data submission and all they must uh, basically have all the measures available for clinicians to choose from with the exception of the QCDR measures and the CAPS measure. So uh, EHR cannot say that they're supporting MVP reporting when they are only limiting the choice and the availability of measures that they're supporting within the MVP, thereby limiting the choices that the clinicians have. The intention is that a third party intermediary supports an MVP and they support all the given quality measures and improvement activities within the MVP and the and the promoting interoperability performance category is well, but then the discretion is left up to their clients or the clinicians or practices that then determine, pick and choose which measures within the MVP they would like to report. We wouldn't want to be in a scenario where the third party intermediary intermediary is limiting the available choices to a clinician and saying you have to report this if you're going to report this MVP. That's not the intention behind having MIPS value pathways available for reporting. It looks like we have Rick Wendo um, with another question. Rick, we just unmuted you. Go ahead and ask your question whenever you're ready. Thank you. Complicated question. Obviously, you know, physical therapists most likely would have the that MSK MVP for 2024. So let's kind of get an understanding of subgroups. So say you have a physician practice that has 16 or more physicians, and they're going to report a different MVP, say for lower extremity, uh, improving care for lower extremity joint repair. And then the practice employs, say, 10 physical therapists, those PTs are going to do as a subgroup the new, that new MSK MVP. Right now, because PTs don't have a, a certified electronic health record, let's just say they don't have it, would that PI category as a subgroup be reweighted? Or because the physician subgroup, they do have P, the PI category available to them, how would that work? regarding the, the weighting category for PI for the PTs doing the subgroup. Hope that makes sense. PTs doing the subgroup, yes. Um, so typically within the scenario of subgroups reporting uh, PI, we require that the subgroup submit the group level data for the entire group, not just the subgroup. So because um, that way, the, basically the group level um, score is what the subgroup will get. 
Uh, but there are circumstances where currently in PI, certain clinician types are exempt from PI. They don't have to report PI. PI is reweighted for them. And if if a given clinician type uh, qualifies for that reweighting, they would continue to qualify for those reweightings in, in MVP reporting as well, if that makes sense. It does, but I mean, for next year, I know PTs don't get reweighted. So in that scenario, then we've got a physician mm -hmm. subgroup and a physical therapy subgroup. Mm -hmm. The PT subgroup would get the the group PI score, so to speak. Correct. Yes, okay. they would, but they would they would have to actually physically submit the group data as the subgroup. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No, thank you. <clears throat> Okay, we're going to go back to the Q&A box. The first question I have for you is, at Will it asks, can MIPS CQMs be reported without utilizing a registry? And it explains, we currently report eCQMs through our EHR vendor and submit a QRDA3 file. We have never reported MIPS CQMs. How would we generate a JSON file to submit MIPS CQMs? Um, yes, you can report the uh, MIPS CQM without utilizing a um, registry or a, qualif or a qualified data registry. Um, you would want to follow the measure specifications for how the element should be constructed, um, which would then be mined through your um, probably your claims data to determine the outputs of uh, the performance met, not met. Um, and exceptions if they're applicable, and then also the creation of the eligible population. Um, from there, it would basically be an output of the data um, that would map to each one of those fields, um, which would also align with the format that is available um, from what uh, Lindsay posted at 1237, where uh, qpp.cms.gov slash developers um, there's information there about um, each one of the constructs within the uh, submission itself and uh, details around each one of the elements. Great, okay. Um, looks like we do have another one that popped up in the Q&A box. And this one asks, if you are reporting an MVP and one or more of the providers leaves the group and you will not submit for that provider for the performance year, do you still include that provider's data in the aggregation of the quality measures for the subgroup or group quality measures, or can you exclude them? Um, ideally, if you're aware of this change and it occurs before registration closes, you would, you would make that amendment within your registration to remove that clinician so that your subgroup uh, subgroup makeup is more accurate and reflects the current state of your group. Um, but if you get to a point where you register as a subgroup and then someone leaves and then uh, they're no longer a part of that group, then I would say you wouldn't, you shouldn't be submitting data for them um, as a subgroup because then uh, they're no longer uh, truly a part of that subgroup where I assume that TIN anymore. Um, it, it wouldn't make sense to continuously include their data for the sake of submission. Okay, we do have one more that came in, and this one asks, can you go over the um, promoting interoperability reporting in MVPs? And just to clarify, if subgroup reporting an MVP, uh, then you would report the group slash 10 level promoting interoperability data. So the the requirements for promoting interoperability for MIPS value pathway reporting are exactly the same of, as of in traditional MIPS. The only uh, caveat that we flagged is if you register as a subgroup, you must, you, you can't submit PI data at the subgroup level. You must include the data for your entire TIN and submit that at the subgroup level to then give you your, your PI scores. Does that cover the question, Matt? Yes, that looks like it does. Okay. 
Okay. So we do have about eight minutes left. Uh, if you still have any questions, please do send them in through either the Q&A box or raise your hand and we will answer your question live. And I would just, I'm taking a look at some of the questions and some of them are, um, are asking with regards to the MVP registration process, if there's going to be any more webinars or resources related to that. I believe we have some resources available um, on our QPP resource library. We have a, a page specifically dedicated to the MIPS value pathways, and I think we can share that link. But I would highly encourage you to take a look at those resources. I think um, there are some uh, guidance materials to help you walk through the registration process and how to complete that uh, and send the necessary information to our QPP service center desk. Um, and if you have any questions related to that, you can always submit a follow-up question to our QPP service center and they'll, they'll be there to help out. Yeah. And just to add to the, the, uh, the chat box, we did just drop in a link for a YouTube video that it's a demonstration video for registration. So it should add some additional, you know, instruction and context there. Um, looks like we did get another question that came into the Q and a box. This one asks if the cost measure in the MVP is not applicable to the clinician type, how is it scored? If the cost measure is not applicable and it cannot be calculated, then we actually reweight. So if none of the cost measures in the MIPS value pathway cannot be can be calculated for whatever reason, we will reweight from cost to quality. And then the weight of quality will be higher and costs, you, you know, you would not be ass assigned a cost score. Uh, quality would weigh more. We would look at your quality results and calculate and um, uh, assign a score accordingly. Right. So we're not seeing any more questions in the Q&A box. Um, and we haven't had any calls. Okay, I think we did just get a caller. So Chris and McIntosh, we have just unmuted the line. Feel free to ask your question. Great. Can you hear me? I just wanted to um, clarify with the registration process. So if you're submitting um, on behalf of individual uh, providers, will they all have their own unique MVP submission ID? So there isn't, and this is Mara Marzen, a contractor with Center for Medicare. Um, we don't assign a submission ID um, during the registration process. Um, except to subgroups. So this, there's a subgroup okay. identifier that's assigned um, or that's um, provided following registration. Um, and that's not to be confused with the MVP identifier that's included in the data that's submitted. So each individual MVP has an alphanumeric code that needs to be submitted um, with submission or in their submission. And if you're reporting on behalf of a subgroup, that additional subgroup identifier would need to be included. Um, but for group reporting, it's the TIN that identifies the group. And for individuals, it's the TIN and NPI. So there's no additional identifiers needed for those reporting. So what identifies um, an MVP submission versus the traditional MIPS submission? Yes, and that's the MVP identifier. If you look on the QPP website on the uh -huh. or MVPs page, we list out each of the um, MVPs and underneath each of the names is an actual MVP ID. Oh, so, so I see, okay. Yes, and so that's the information that's included in the submission to distinguish it between from a traditional MIP submission. Okay, so, so it would be that MVP ID 001 or what exactly. have you. Exactly. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. So we're going to take another quick scan through the Q&A box to see if anything pops up. We do not have any other callers. Um, and it does not look like we have any new questions. So I, I do think at this point, we are going to end the Q&A portion. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so we are just we do just want to post this help and resources slide again, uh, just for everybody's reference. Um, and before I, I turn it back over to Sophia to give the closing statements, I do just 
want to remind everyone that both the slides and a recording of this webinar from today will be posted on the QPP webinar library within the coming weeks. So it'd be a good place to look for that here in the near future. But I will now turn it back over to Sophia to close us out for the day. Thanks, Matt. And thank you all for joining today. Really appreciated um, you know, the time we took to go through the questions. And um, certainly, if you have additional questions, feel please feel free to submit those to the service center. Uh, we're, we're standing by to answer your questions. But um, hopefully this was helpful. The recording will be posted soon as well as the slide deck. So you'll have the more specific FAQs um, uh, through the slide deck for you to have on as a reference point. Um, and we look forward to continuously uh, engaging with you. So thank you and have a great day, everyone.